This is 105.9 The Region, where parents talk and explore practical, proactive, and evidence-based solutions. This is Where Parents Talk with Leanne Castellino. Hello and welcome to this edition of Where Parents Talk on 105.9 The Region. It's great to have you along. Thanks for joining us. I'm Leanne Castellino. Coming up later in the show, the results and learnings from a national poll of parents on gratitude. First up, stress. Developing coping skills to combat worry, stress, and uncertainty are important tools for all of us, but especially children. To discuss that, we're joined by Katie Hurley, a child and adolescent psychotherapist, author, parenting educator, and mom of two teens. Her latest book, published in November 2021, is called The Stress Buster Workbook for Kids. Katie Hurley joins us from California. Welcome, Katie, and thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. So there's so much to get into on a timely topic that we seem to be talking about uh, quite a bit these days, certainly during this pandemic time. What are the main sources of stress today that you see impacting children and adolescents in your work? Oh, goodness. Loaded question out of the gate. Um, (laughs) I think kids right now are just facing layers and layers of stress. So as we semi emerge from the pandemic, although we're still kind of in it, it, as parents, as I keep saying to parents, every time we feel like we've gotten through it, another variant comes through and we sort of start rethinking what we're doing. So, you know, kids have been living through this with us, but in their own, through their own lens um, since this thing began. And so first it was disrupted learning, but now they're mostly back in the classroom but the classroom doesn't look the same and the rules have changed and social relationships may have changed when the kids were away from school. So, you know, they really, they face academic stress, they face social stress. Um, They're dealing with high pressure situations depending on where they are developmentally. So our teenagers are sort of in these high stakes learning environments, trying to get into college. Our younger kids are trying to just cope with keeping up. And I think it's an important point to set the table in terms of the types of sources of stress, because depending on where you are in your parenting journey, you may not be seeing some of these things yet and you may not ever. But it's it's good to keep in mind. So, Katie, what concerns you most about what you are seeing both before and during this pandemic as it relates to stress and how kids cope and manage it? We have been seeing anxiety and depression rise among children and adolescents for a you know, years. This is not just the pandemic. It was happening pre-pandemic and the pandemic kind of exacerbated it and and put a giant spotlight on it so that we all could see what was happening. So I think what concerns me most is kids, especially younger children, which is part of why I wrote the new book, the Stress Busters book, kids are struggling to cope with distress of any kind. So the minute kids start to feel uncomfortable, we try to find some sort of strategy or distraction for them so that they don't have to feel discomfort and stress. But the truth is, wherever we go in life, we're going to experience some amount of stress. That's part of being a human. And not all stress is actually bad. There is such a thing as good stress. So when we constantly sweep it away and we don't give them the opportunity to learn how to cope from a young age on up, then they don't build adaptive coping skills and it does snowball as they get older. So my messaging for parents of younger kids right now is really, let's just talk about it. Let's talk about the ups and downs, the good feelings, the yucky feelings. Let's normalize just working through our feelings as they arise so that we're not trying to dodge them all the time. For many families and certainly many parents, part of the issue is is within themselves. So if they're not able to manage their own stress or cope with it in some meaningful way, that is going to be seen and felt and heard by their children. How much does that factor into how a kid uh, will ultimately be able to handle their own stress? Yeah, it's it's hard. And I, I will say I empathize with parents as someone who has a 15-year-old and a 13-year-old. And I remember you know, the younger ages, the things that would crop up. I have a ton of empathy for parents because the thing that you hear from people like me all the time is model it, model it, model it. They're always watching what you do. They will do what you do, not what you say. And that's another layer of pressure for parents. Like I even have to cope perfectly. But the truth is that stress 
trickles down in families. Research shows that. So if the stress is coming from the top, kids not only can read it and pick up on it, but they will emulate the strategies we use, good, bad, or indifferent. So we always have to be you know, thinking about how we're modeling our coping skills. And if we are struggling, then what I say is call it out. Say, you know, and I'm known to do this in my own family, but to say, you know what, I'm feeling really stressed right now and I don't know what to do. I'm going to go outside and take a walk or I'm just going to read a book for a minute and I'll get back to you. Um, I think as parents, we feel this pressure to have all the answers all the time and to know what to do all the time. And that's just not realistic. So owning our own emotions and showing kids that even adults sometimes aren't sure how to cope, but by saying it and owning it, that's a first step toward working through it. We are in conversation with Katie Hurley, licensed clinical social worker, child and adolescent psychotherapist, author, writer, and mom. Her book is called The Stress Buster Workbook for Kids. You share 75 evidence-based strategies for parents, educators, and others. And it's aimed at kids 4 to 11 years old, but the concepts certainly are, are pertinent as well to older, older age groups. Could you give us some everyday examples and corresponding stress-busting strategies that go with them? For sure. Yeah. So, you know, I've been working on these for, I've been in, doing this for over 24 years now. So a lot of these strategies are things I've, you know, developed and worked on over time to get to a place where I feel like they do work with the kids I work with that come through my office. So that's kind of the good news about it is these things have been tested. You know, not only are they researched, but they're also just tested in the in the real world with real kids. And my own kids have to use them like it or not <laughs> sometimes. So, you know, I always suggest um, early in the book, I talk about a couple of important things. One is using for younger children, something like a feelings check-in board or a feelings faces poster because it's it's really hard to put the names of feelings to the faces for little kids. But if they have a poster that they can look at, that they can check in on, that they can just point and say, I, I'm not sure how I feel, but that's it. That's what it looks like. This gives parents an indicator of how they're doing. Now, with older kids, I suggest using a mood meter. This is something they can draw on their own, or there are even apps for it. We know our teenagers love apps. Um, and the whole family can use a mood meter, but it's essentially like a thermometer with different colors and you kind of identify a mood for color. So if, if red is angry and blue is sad and green is calm, you have this rainbow of colors with corresponding moods and you can kind of point to where I am on the meter right now, where I was when I was at school, where I was this morning. It's just a good way to get the whole family talking about the fact that it's natural to have mood shifts throughout the day. Um, so that's always a good starting point. When you talk about foundational principles that parents should teach their kids about managing stress and worry, is there such a thing as some, you know, key pillars that they can learn and then build on top of? For sure. I mean, we know that the single best strategy for managing things is actually deep breathing. And people get tired of hearing about deep breathing. But what I have found over and over again is that a lot of people don't know how to do it correctly and it takes time and it takes practice. So, you know, in the book, you'll see um, a strategy called square breathing. And this is essentially where you're, you're inhaling for four, holding for four, exhaling for four and holding for four while tracing a square in the palm of your hand. And the, the tracing helps you slow down your breathing. Um, we always say deep breathing, but I actually, when I teach it to children and families, what I say is slow breathing. Because what we want to take really deep breaths, but we want them to go in and out slowly. That's how we regulate our central nervous system. So sometimes you say, take a deep breath to kids and they breathe in too quickly and it actually doesn't work. It actually dysregulates them more. So that's kind of a, a tool that every family should have in their kit. And there are great apps for it. The Calm app is my absolute favorite because they have, you know, tools for kids, for middle schoolers, for high schoolers, for parents. It's sort of a one size fits all deep breathing and mindfulness app. So that's that's a good place to start. And then, you know, from there, I also always suggest working on just cognitive reframing, which is a fancy way of saying, flip your thoughts. So take whatever thought is worrying you, you know, I, oh, my mom is running late and I'm going to be left here by myself. And what if she doesn't pick me up? You know, own that thought, say, oh, this thought is making me feel uncomfortable. I'm really scared she's not going to come. And then turn it into something realistic. So not super over the top positive, but just realistic. Like, 
well, my mom has never forgotten to pick me up before. My mom always does pick me up at soccer practice or whatever it is. So really learning the art of, of you know, reframing your thoughts in a realistic, positive way. One thing that social media has sort of put into our heads is, is what we call toxic positivity, which is that we're always going overboard with everything is awesome. Everything's amazing. Best day ever. Well, that's kind of toxic because because nobody has the best day ever every single day. And it doesn't actually help you flip your anxious thinking. But if you can tap into realistic positive thinking, that will help calm you. It is so easy. It's human nature to slide into a negative mindset almost automatically. And, you know, positive thinking is is far more a discipline, I would think. I'm not an expert, but it's more challenging to think positively, especially in a world today where when you turn on the TV or your device or read the paper or whatever it is, there's just an onslaught of negativity. So what does it take to combat that um, as a child or an adolescent? It, it does. It takes a lot of practice. It also takes a lot of patience, I think, on the part of parents. Because we're hearing so much about this, it, it feels again like there's this other layer of, oh no, my kid's a negative thinker, my kid's a quitter, what am I doing wrong? And the truth is that these are muscles. So um, Barbara Fredrickson down at UNC Chapel Hill developed what she called the broaden and build theory. And essentially what that means is that when you fill your brain with positive thoughts, it, ex- it expands your mind. So you, you have more opportunities to think positive. It's sort of like snowballs inside your mind. But what she pointed out is that negative thinking is very, very heavy. So it actually takes three realistic positive thoughts to outweigh one negative thought. So that's a ratio I give to families all the time because it's easy for, to get into the habit of, oh no, here's all the things going wrong. But to get to work through those and kind of get those out of our frame, we have to hit every negative with three positives. But when you know the ratio, it actually can be really useful. And so I say it to my own kids all the time, like, I see that sticky thinking, that sticky thinking is getting you down. Give me your three, like, just give me your three, (laughs) yell them out. And and that's how we kind of flip it quickly in the moment. But it takes a lot of practice. And also it takes um, a lot of patience on the part of kids because they're growing up in this time of instant gratification. Everything's perfect on social media. Very little kids are using Instagram and they're, they're seeing these sort of unrealistic, you know, photos of perfection. And so we're always reaching a little bit higher than we need to. But if we can slow ourselves down and say, well, my positive thoughts for right now are, you know, my kids are healthy. Um, I My book is doing pretty well. And I have all the work that I need to have right now. Like those are three realistic positive thoughts for me to keep in my brain so that even, even when I get super stressed out because I'm, I'm not hitting the marks and I'm up late on emails and things, I can slow myself down and say, hey, here's three realistic things to ground myself and and remember that I'm actually, things are going okay for me right now. And that's the hard part because kids are always shooting for the moon right now. You know, I want to be, not just I want to be a basketball player, I want to play in the NBA. It's like, well, how about I just want to have a good game today and fun with my friends? You know, we have to kind of come back down to that basic level of self-love so that we can practice realistic thinking. Tons of great advice and certainly wonderful food for thought. Katie Hurley, psychotherapist, author of The Stress Buster Workbook for Kids. Thank you so much for your insight today. Thank you. Want to learn more about the show? Email info at whereparentstalk.com. Stick around. Leanne Castellino and Where Parents Talk will be right back on 1059 The Region. Welcome back to Where Parents Talk. Listen live at 1059theregion.com. Here's Leanne Castellino. Welcome back. Is showing gratitude a priority in your household? Do your children regularly express their appreciation for what they have? That was the theme of a recent poll conducted by the University of Michigan Health. The national poll surveyed parents of kids between 4 and 10 years of age. Sarah Clark is a research scientist in the Department of Pediatrics at C.S. Mott Children's Hospital. She's also co-director of the poll and a mom of two. She joins us today from Ann Arbor, Michigan. 
Welcome to Where Parents Talk, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Take us through the rationale and impetus for conducting a national poll on this topic. Each month, we release a report on a different child health topic. And it's interesting because people don't necessarily think of something like gratitude as being related to child health. But research has shown that it really does. Kids who are grateful and who are able to show gratitude have better mental health. They have more empathy. And here's where it really matters. They're more resilient. And that makes sense, right? When kids are able to appreciate the positive aspects of their lives and the situations they're in, they won't be as overwhelmed when things don't go their way. So it's interesting. We're talking about parents of children between four and 10 years old. Can you tell us what the top three findings were? Well, over 80% of parents say kids today are grateful for what they have, but three quarters of them say teaching gratitude as a high priority. And you would think those two things would balance out. But here's where number three comes in. Many parents aren't really doing much beyond having their kids say please and thank you as a way to instill gratitude. And if those just become magic words that kids say to get the reward, then it isn't doing what we want it to do. So it's interesting, that disconnect between the high number of parents who say they prioritize teaching gratitude versus the high number who believe that their children aren't thankful enough. What do you believe is causing that disconnect? You know, it's interesting. Parents do seem to have a sense that there is something that's not right. Over half the parents worry they're giving their kids too much, uh, which is a good signal. And 42% have been embarrassed when their child acted selfishly, like, uh, you know, didn't say thank you when they got a gift or wouldn't share. So I think parents are looking at those situations and maybe comparing what their kid has in the way of material things to what it was like when they were younger. And it does seem like it's really different. Absolutely. We live in such a different world today. And and many parents, you know, just looking at at society would say, well, we live in a a kind of a selfish world, as it were. So how do you counter that? Well, I do think that um, times like the holidays throughout the year, but especially the holidays, give parents some great opportunities to involve their children in First, understanding that there are other people who may not have as much and to turn that into action and help them. And one of the ways that parents really can think about doing that is personalizing the situation so their child makes a strong connection to the person who might be receiving their gift or their donation or their assistance. So an example I like to give is a mitten drive where parents can explain to younger kids, some some children don't have warm mittens and their hands might get cold on the way to school, and then ask their child not to give away the extras or um, the things that would otherwise be thrown away, but to pick something lovely, pick a pair of mittens that this child would say think is soft and warm and wonderful and really help the child understand that feeling um, of of joy or something that's really special. What we want to do is help kids get to the point where we want all people to feel special, to feel loved, to feel included. And part of uh, the experiences that parents can choose is to find things where kids will be able to make that personal connection between what I have what some other child currently doesn't have. And now let's put that together and we can, we can uh, make something special happen. You are listening to Where Parents Talk on 105.9 The Region. And we're talking about a recent national poll conducted by the University of Michigan Health. It examines parents' views about gratitude in their children. Our guest is Sarah Clark, research scientist at C.S. Mott Children's Hospital in Michigan and co-director of the poll. Sarah, I'm curious, you do these polls monthly, as you mentioned, and you are, you know, right front and center with respect to the the uh, results and, and the whole process of the poll. What struck you about the findings of this particular poll? 
Wow. Well, the big thing is that um, only a quarter of parents have their kids regularly draw or write thank you cards. That would not have flown when uh, I was young because my mother was a stickler on that. But more importantly, it really prevents children from having that opportunity to think about not only the gift, but also the giver and uh, drive home that message of, hey, somebody took the time to pick out a gift for you or to take you on a special experience. So I was just struck that maybe parents today uh, view thank you cards a little differently than they did back in my day. Your mom and my mom were the exact same, Sarah, apparently, because I was brought up as well to always thank people and certainly with a card or a letter that was just, you know, a foregone conclusion. So I concur. I, I still do that today and I, I do that with my children as well. Um, you know, thank you cards saying please and thank you. Are there any other ways that parents can cultivate gratitude in their children? One way that not everybody realizes is part of nurturing gratitude is to have children help with household chores. And what's going on there is it's helping kids understand the connection, uh, understand that, hey, things don't just happen by magic in this house uh, in terms of dinner getting ready or toys getting picked up or the, the sidewalk being shoveled. Everybody can participate. And what's really key as parents think about uh, doing something like this is to not have chores be a punishment, but talk about chores as, hey, how are we all going to work together this Saturday morning to get done the things necessary to run our little community here? And then we can move on to our fun things that we have planned for the afternoon. And chores are just a hop, skip, and a jump to volunteer activities as kids get a little older, maybe in those teenage years, where you're still making the connection of, hey, this kid or this teen is part of a community and he or she has a role to play in making things work well. Absolutely. Now, speaking of that adolescent age group, what do you think that parents of teens can take away from a poll like the one that we're talking about? I think the biggest thing parents can learn is that they need to be purposeful about nurturing gratitude and about creating opportunities for their kids to learn that lesson. And teenagers have great opportunities at this time of year to participate in some behind the scenes uh, volunteering or helping it might be preparing a holiday meal. It might be um, entertaining younger children while parents go shopping, contributing to a school event. But what we want to do is have our teens understand how much effort goes into making these kinds of things happen. And then look around and appreciate, look at all of the people giving their time to make this meal be beautiful, to make this school event be successful. Um, and so they get that connection of, hey, I can do my part to also make things go and to be grateful for all of those people who are doing so many things to make their lives interesting and fun and rich. Now, as a mom of two yourself, Sarah, and your, your children are a little older, so past this particular polling group, but what did you take away uh, from, I guess, you know, the results of this poll, uh, maybe looking back on when your kids were younger? So one of the things that we used to do was make holiday cards for people who might not otherwise get them. So the mailman, the custodian at school, the uh, person that worked behind the counter at the bakery, and not just write happy holidays, but include a thank you message in there. So thank you for always picking out my favorite donut, I think was one of the ones I remember. Or uh, thank you for bringing my shoe, my new shoes for the mailman that brought a special package. And it's, you can, again, just look every day. There are opportunities out there for you to do that work of creating situations to nurture gratitude. 
Now, I'm curious, what, if anything, would you say that the poll illustrated for you about parents today in general on this topic of of teaching their kids gratitude? The desire is there. And I'm and I some parents seem to be articulating that they are um, trying to take steps to teach their children gratitude. It does seem to me, though, that maybe parents are realizing that this is part of their job as parents. It's a long list of jobs that parents have. And I don't mean to be um, overly negative, but I would, I look at these poll results and I just wonder if parents quite understand that they are going to have to move this along, nudge their kids, create those opportunities, and most importantly, be a role model for expressing gratitude. Kids need to see them, see their parents being grateful to each other, being grateful to other family members, being grateful to people in their community to fully understand, oh yeah, that's part of being a a person in this family and and a person in this community. Certainly a most important message, um, teaching your kids gratitude with a lifelong impact, certainly. Sarah Clark, research scientist at the University of Michigan, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Thank you so much for having me and happy holidays. That concludes this edition of Where Parents Talk on 105.9 The Region. Remember, we've got all kinds of parenting tips, strategies, and advice from leading experts on whereparentstalk.com. Check out our weekly giveaways as well. Until next time, I'm Leanne Castellino. Thanks for listening. Sign up for Leanne's parenting newsletter and so much more at whereparentstalk.com. This is Where Parents Talk on 105.9 The Region. 